on sack of Arab Spring. No, I'm not. Because I do believe that this, that this concept, in fact, is not ours. It's European concept, French concept. You probably know that in their history in Europe, uh, there have been a lot of revolutions in the, 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 uh, the spring. I, uh, let me remind you that in Czechoslovakia, there was a revolution in the spring of 68, in France also. This is why when there is revolution like this, European thing, uh, within their own framework, uh, they think that uh, this is why they call the Arab, the, 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 the Arab Revolution uh, Arab Spring. But in fact, the image is not good. Why? Because you know, when you think about spring, you think about birds, about the you know, nice uh, landscape, uh, the green leaves, and so forth, beauty, harmony. But what happened during uh, what happened during uh, those so-called Arab Spring was far from this image, you know. In Tunisia, we had have 300 poor young people killed. We have had more than 2,000 people wounded. In Egypt, the price was even higher. And I'm not talking about what happened in Syria. So talking about uh, 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 Spring, an Arab Spring, when you have such an amount of blood, it's, it's not correct. I would prefer to talk about uh, the image, the best image for me would be the Arab volcanoes or the Arab earthquake. That would be, because you probably know that when you have volcanoes, you, you have also wounded and killed. So, but now the word is uh, widely used. I use it myself, but I'm not convinced, as I told you, I prefer to talk about uh, Arab volcanoes it's much more uh, relevant than Arab Spring. But anyway, the problem is not there. The problem is what's behind the concept. What's, what does it mean? What's the common ground between all the, the, the revolutions, whether in Syria, in, uh, in, in Iraq, in uh, Yemen, in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia? I would say that the main issue, the main problem, uh, the common ground between all this revolution is what I would call uh, a clash between the society and the state. This clash between the society and the state is due to the fact that, this is what I was talking in the previous lecture, that we Arabs, we have now real modern societies, real modern societies. I mean societies linked to the world especially the young generation is extremely linked to the world by Facebook, by Twitter, and by etc., etc. But even before that, before that, my generation was linked to the world. In the 80s, you know, in Tunisia, we have, we have had this very strong civil society with, with uh, many, many organizations in human rights, in uh, trade unions, uh, and so forth. So, we, I can say that we Arabs, we have, we have modern societies, but unfortunately we have archaic states. Our states didn't evolve like our societies. Our states are still what I call Khaldunian states. I mean states built on Asabiya. And the Asabiya, you probably know what does it mean for Ibn Khaldun, Asabiya, it means the I feel that I belong to my tribe. My duties are vis-a-vis -vis my tribe. And me and my cousin and, you know, my, uh, we are against the other, the other tribe. And when we take power, it's for our own benefits, not for the benefits of the whole society. And this problem is that our, our states have been built since the 14th century, since Ibn Khaldun described this kind of, uh, power, we still have Khaldun states. We still have states that belong to the minority. And these minority, they, they, belong, they, they believe that they have, they have the right to have the power and to keep it and to use it for their own benefits. And the other part, the, the, so in fact, you know, uh, in Tunisia, we all the time speak about citizens. We say that we are citizens. In fact, we are not citizens. Citizens are a tiny minority within the society. 
So everywhere you have this the confrontation between the Khaldunian state, an archaic state, and the modern society. Modern society willing to have the same rights that European, that the American have. Don't forget that we are, especially in Tunisia, for, for, we are a middle class society. Um, this, the middle class society is extremely uh, important in, uh, in Tunisia, but not only in Tunisia, in Asia, in, in Syria, in Lebanon. And this elite, of course, cannot accept the dictatorship, cannot accept the corrupt di dictatorship. And the failure of the dictatorship in, uh, in, in our countries, if you, if you want to try to think about the difference between the Western dictatorships, the Nazi, for instance, dictatorship, and the Chinese dictatorship, and our own dictatorship, you will see the difference. The difference is that even under the Nazi, of course, I'm against any, any dictatorship, especially in the, the Nazi dictatorship, but when you think about the dream of the Nazi, the Nazis, they, they dreamed about superior race, about uh, uh, my Germany, uh, same thing for the Chinese, but for the, our dictatorship, the main problem was to, you know, to take the power, have the power, have the wealth, keep the wealth within a tiny group. And this is why uh, our, our dictatorship has have been destructive for our societies. So this is why you have had this clash. Sooner or later, you would have it. And where this class didn't happen yet, I can assure you that you will see this clash everywhere where you have this collision between modern society and an archaic state. Everywhere in the Arab world. When I talk about the image of volcanoes, you know that volcanoes can erupt many, many years. So don't, don't, don't believe that uh, well, you didn't have this kind of revolution. I'm not going to, know, to, to, to tell you this country or that country, but be sure that everywhere where you have this society, this mother society, and this archaic state, you will have a revolution sooner or, or later. The third question I am asking is, why did Tunisia succeed its democratic transition while it didn't succeed in Egypt, in Syria, in, Li in uh, Libya, or in Yemen. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that we, in Tunisia, we did succeed, really, our, uh, our democratic transition. It's more peaceful, yes, this is true. But I'm not sure that we achieved the objectives of the revolution. I would say that we achieved half of the objectives. We achieve the fact that now we are a free society. It's true that we have freedom of expression, freedom of association, free elections, and so forth. But the most important objective of the revolution has not been achieved yet. Social justice, fighting against corruption. We didn't achieve at all this, this, this part of the, uh, of the objective of the revolution. So, but let's say that we didn't pay very high price paid, for, for instance, by our brothers in Syria or in Libya or even in, in Egypt. So why did we have? Why did you have uh, this peaceful transition? I'm not going to say that Tunisians are better, uh, that Tunisians are smarter, that Tunisians are no Tunisians are like everybody. You know, human beings are the same everywhere. Uh, so the reason why. We, we did it better than in Libya, for instance, is that because of the structure of our society. Tunisia is a homogeneous society. 99% of Tunisians are Arab Muslim Malikites, Sunni Maliki. This is very important. This is very important. This, is, this made things easier. Imagine when you compare to Syria where you have many religions, many sects, etc., etc. So it's easier for our society, you know, to reach an agreement. We could reach an agreement about the Constitution easily. We have had just some discussion about um, Sharia or not Sharia. We have had discussion, hard discussion between secularists and Islamists. But we, we, we did it. I, I mean, we, we, we could achieve 
an agreement. But imagine, uh, uh, imagine uh, writing down a constitution when you have uh, Muslim, Christian, when you have groups and so forth. So because our society was a homogeneous society, we could reach this agreement, not because we were better or smarter than, than Syria. Also, when you compare to Libya, uh, even under the dictatorship, uh, we have had, we had a very important uh, network of uh, civil rights organizations, political parties, etc., etc., trade unions. So, but under the dictatorship, under the Gaddafi, this was not thinkable, you know. Uh, the dictatorship in Libya destroyed everything, destroyed the civil society and prevented even the civil society to be to exist. So when we had to discuss the future of Tunisia, it was easy because the network was there. Now when you compare to Egypt, when you compare to Egypt, the main difference between us and the Egyptian is that in Tunisia, the military is not corrupted and the military is not involved in politics. The military in Egypt, in, in Tunisia, is not involved in business, is not involved in politics. This is why we never fail a coup like in Egypt. After the coup in Egypt in, uh, in uh, July uh, 2013, many people in Tunisia, they were afraid of having the same scenario. Egyptian scenario, and they said, "No, don't worry. I know, I know the military because I was the commander in chief, and then I knew the officer, and all." They said, "Look, Mr. President, we are faithful to the republic. We are faithful to the law. You don't have." They didn't say, "Don't have to fear us," but they said, "Me, we are going. Don't, don't fear. The law would be would be respected everywhere." So. This, 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 this is also the difference between, between us and uh, Now the main difference also is Tunisia is not, we don't have tribes. Fortunately, Tunisia is once again a homogeneous society, middle class society, westernized society in some, some. So for all those reasons, it was easy to, uh, to achieve an agreement. And also because we have this national dialogue going on since, uh, I would say, uh, the first national dialogue, we have it in France, under the dictatorship uh, between the, the opposition party. We discussed, I, I remember that we have had an important meeting in, Tunisia, in, in France in 2003, and that what we discussed at the time, secularists and Islamists who discussed the Tunisia future, and I can assure you that many ideas that now we have in the Constitution was discussed at this level and at that time in, uh, under the dictatorship. This didn't happen in, in, in other, uh, in, like in Syria or in Yemen at all. So we can be very proud of what we have achieved in Tunisia, but we have to be also very humble because we, if we did it, once again, it's not because we were smarter or uh, more peaceful people also, but because of the structure of our country. But this means also that if you want to have a, de a democracy in our country, you have to have an important civil society, you have to have a, a, a military not involved in politics or in business, you have to have, uh, I wouldn't say a homogeneous society, uh, but you have to try to make people share common values. And the only common values now you can share when you have a diverse society, I, I think, is human rights and democracy. Now the, the last question, the fourth question, and the most difficult, is I'm asking what will be the outcome? What will be the outcome in Syria, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya, and so forth? Do we think that now the Arab Spring is over, and that uh, you lost the war. Once again, you, uh, as I told you, it's half victory in Tunisia because we didn't achieve all our objective. And you see the situation in Egypt. They have a harsh dictatorship, more corrupted, more violent than even before the revolution. 
you see how uh, tragic is the civil war in, in Syria, how tragic is the civil war in Libya, in, uh, in Yemen. So many people would say, uh, do we think that there is still hope? Well, the problem is, I hear also in Tunisia, other people saying, look, this, this was your fault. Look at what, what happened now. We were much better before. But what they forget is that if we have had this revolution, it was not because you know people was just wanted to have